Hi everybody, this is Phil Smith. I want to welcome you to my brand new YouTube channel, Meanwhile in Tokyo. The purpose of this channel is to document and archive information about my recent discovery of my family in Japan. Um, if you know me personally or know me through Facebook, you know that I've undergone an amazing experience recently. All of this took place on Facebook, but I've determined that YouTube would be a better platform to share this information. Um, it's a better way to archive uh, videos, tell the story, allow people to catch up, and also to document by video and additional post my journey to Japan, which will be coming up in November. This story began 63 years ago in Tokurazawa, Saitama, Japan. My mother was a Japanese woman who was married to an American sailor. Um, they had me. And he went to sea and he never returned. My adoptive parents, Don and Revzi Smith, uh, were at Johnston Air Force Base and were introduced to my mother and to me by an acquaintance on the air base there. Um, they couldn't have kids of their own, but they fell in love with me and then they agreed to adopt me and bring me back to the United States. The rest of my life was lived as an American Air Force brat traveling around the United States and overseas a couple of times um, until we finally came to Oklahoma and settled in 1972, a couple of years before I graduated from high school. Um, and I've lived here ever since. My parents were always open with me about the fact that I was adopted. Uh, there was never any question that my mother gave me up as an act of love and compassion and generosity uh, so that I could have a better life than she could ever have provided for me in Japan. I remember that it was less than 15 years since the end of World War II, since the atomic bombs were dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Uh, there was still anti-American sentiment there. And so I don't think that I ever had any question in my mind that my mother loved me. And uh, the reason she gave me up is because she couldn't provide for me in post-war Japan. As I grew up, I remember feeling a little bit different, a little bit out of place, but I don't remember ever being picked on or bullied or anything like that because I was Japanese. And I looked a lot more Japanese when I was young than I did after I got a little bit older. But I don't think that I really gave it much thought about trying to go back and find my biological parents. Um, how would you do that anyway? It was before the internet, uh, short of taking a trip to Japan and trying to do your own research, it would have been very difficult to do that. And in any case, I got busy with life, graduated from school, uh, got a job, got married, eventually had children and a family. And so I just got busy with life. So I, even though I thought about it, um, I didn't ever take any action. And then two years ago, on a Sunday afternoon, my father called and said, hey, can I come by? I have something you might like to have. I didn't give it much thought. Dad was 86 at the time. And he was going through stuff he had in storage, trying to get rid of things and simplify his life. When he came over, he handed me a box, and when I opened it, it contained an ornate Japanese photo album. It was black and red and old and beautiful. We all sat down, and I opened it. On the very first page, there was a photo of my biological mother and a photo of me. I peeled her photo from the page, and on the back was written, January 1, 1959, 28 years old, Yuri Kagawa. As I looked through the photo album, there were other photos of me as a child, some with Yuri, some with my adopted parents. There were also old, yellowed rice paper documents in Japanese, and I could only imagine what they contained. My wife and kids, my dad and his wife and I, all enjoyed looking through this treasure, but I had no idea how this moment would change everything. At the time that this happened, I was already a regular Facebook user. Um, I liked to post information about my band and my music. I uh, had a personal page, though, and, and shared information on a regular basis. Uh, anyway, I took photos of some of the, the documents and posted them on my Facebook page. And I had a lot of response, a lot of likes, a lot of comments from people who were interested in this discovery. But most importantly, my good friend Nikki's wife's cousin's daughter shared the post with her friend in California, whose name is Tomoko. Tomoko is Japanese, is married to an American, and she is an angel that was brought into my life to make all of this happen. She offered to translate the documents for me, and so I immediately scanned the documents and emailed them to her. 
And within a few days, I had a translated version of all of these documents, and they were a gold mine. One was my adoption papers. Another was my Japanese birth certificate, which included my mother's and father's birth date and birthplace. I began researching online and quickly discovered that my father came back to the United States and remarried, but never had any biological children. He did have stepchildren, and he died about 12 years ago. To be honest, I didn't feel any desire to locate any of my extended family on that side, but I may have felt differently if I had half-brothers and sisters from him. Though it was easy to find him since he was in the United States, it was not so easy with my mother. I tried social media, Google, Ancestry, and things like that, but didn't have any luck because of the language barrier. Tomoko tried also and had no luck, but suggested that with the information that we had, we could request family registry information, or koseki, from Saitama Prefecture. She offered to help me complete the request form in Japanese and send the request along with the legal documents that we had to have to authorize them to release the information to me. We sent our request in early September of 2017, and in a couple of weeks we received a response back that said that all the family information had been transferred to Hino City Prefecture. Though Yuri lived in Saitama when I was born, she moved to Hino City and the records were transferred there. So Tomoko helped to prepare another information request to send there. That request was sent in late September of 2017 and a couple of weeks later we received the response back from Hino City. Yuri Kagawa died in Omeshi, Tokyo on November 13th, 2012 at 8.46 a.m. I was five years too late. Still, I had hoped in my heart that somewhere up there Yuri knew that I searched for her, but any dreams of a tearful, joyous physical reunion were now gone. Tomoko was just as sad about the news as I was. We had often talked about how we were doing the work, but that the universe was in control. There was no way to predict if we would find Yuri at all, or if we did, what the results would look like. Tomoko would later say that she felt Yuri was guiding her through all of this. But as it turned out, there was more work to do. The information obtained from Saitama indicated that Yuri had a son. When the information came back about Yuri's death, the person that reported her death was her son, Koichi Kagawa. I have a half-brother. The officials would not release any information about Koichi to me. I could only request information about my parent or child. All we knew is that he also lived in Tokyo at the time of her death. Of course, I searched on Google and social media, but when I searched Facebook for Koichi Kagawa in Japan, I got hundreds of results, and almost all of them were in Japanese. Tomoko did her best and had no luck either. We decided that I would write a letter to Koichi, and we would send it to the five-year-old address that we had for Yuri at the time of her death, and hope that the letter would find its way to him. It took a while for me to overcome my discouragement and disappointment, but I finally put together a letter and a group of photographs, and we mailed it in May of 2018. Three months later, the package was returned undeliverable. During this time, I also did some online research and found out that there were thousands of people like me, people who were the product of a relationship between Japanese women and American servicemen. I read articles online about Japanese war brides and even found an investigation firm in Tokyo that could help locate lost family members. I vowed that when possible, I would bear the expense to hire a Tokyo investigator to find my brother. But time passed, and though the thoughts about continuing the search were still there, life happened and months slipped by. There was time to thank Tomoko and to get to know her better. There was time to find out that her story is just as compelling, being a victim of chronic long-term Lyme disease, being homebound and sometimes bedridden during this entire journey. But despite everything else going on in our lives, Tomoko had not given up and continued to search for Koichi Kagawa. On February 16th, 2019, Tomoko emailed me and said that she had gone back on Japanese social media and this time she discovered a Koichi Kagawa that seemed to be the right age and living close by where my mother's last residence was. She asked me if I wanted to send him a message and I said, yes, let's do. She said that he had a Facebook account which had not been active for a couple of years and she gave me that information and I went online and checked it out. I looked at the photographs that were posted and there seemed to be a resemblance. I showed them to my family and they definitely thought there was a resemblance, so I began to get a little hopeful. 
Though he wasn't active on his Facebook account, there was a link to his Instagram account that he posted to regularly. So Tomoko sent a direct message to him and attached a photo of my mother. As we waited for days and then weeks, I just really thought, oh, okay, it's not the right guy, or if it is, he doesn't want to have anything to do with some guy in the United States that's reaching out to him, you know, or he just thought the message was some kind of a scam. The excitement was starting to wane when on March the 7th, Tomoko said he finally responded and said, Yes, that's my mom. Why do you want to know? Tomoko was able to tell him that he had a brother in the United States named Philip who was trying to find him. And at that point, he acknowledged that he actually knew about me and that I actually have not only him, but an older half-brother named Yasuo. Yasuo was adopted by Yuri's sister. So Yasuo and Koichi grew up as cousins, but found out before Yuri died that they were actually brothers. And Yasuo remembered me since he was eight years old when I was adopted. Not only that, Yasuo and Koichi had talked about me and wished they could figure out how to find me. When Tomoko called and told me about her text conversation, all of the emotions of this two-year journey were released. So for the last few months, we have started to get to know each other by sending photos back and forth, emails that Tomoko would translate for us, I wrote a letter about my life that Tomoko translated and emailed to them. We arranged a three-way Skype with them and Tomoko translated and it was amazing. Now we communicate through Instagram group chat using Google Translate so that we can keep in touch on an almost daily basis. My wife and I and our three kids are all going to Tokyo in November for a week. In the meantime, I'm trying to learn some Japanese using Duolingo and Japanese Pod 101 and I binge watch YouTube videos about Japan. To end this chapter, I just want to say thank you to all the people who personally and on social media on Facebook and Instagram have been so supportive and so kind and uh, have shared with me how it they've connected to this story. Uh, in some cases, I've had persons who were adopted tell me that it gave them the courage the inspiration to perhaps pursue their own adoption stories. I know that my story has had the very best possible ending, even though we didn't find Yuri. Uh, we did find that I have family there, and I know that Yuri will be there when we're reunited. I think this has really been a demonstration in my own life, proof in my own life, that if I just take the actions and leave the results up to the universe, to God, that everything works out the way it is supposed to. People have told me that this is an amazing story, and I, I know it is. I feel it is. I certainly couldn't have written the story out in a different way that could have been more amazing. This has been a gift, a gift for which I am deeply and overwhelmingly grateful. Please stay tuned to this channel. I'm going to post updates on this journey, uh, share some additional content, uh, There'll be other episodes about Tomoko, and I plan to post links to some sites that might be helpful to adoptees, uh, people who are familiar with the battle with Lyme disease. And please press the like button. Please subscribe to this channel. Uh, hit the bell to be notified when additional content becomes available. Also, when we go to Tokyo in November, I'll be posting videos here to this channel so people can share those with us. I look forward to everything that we are going to experience in the near future. Um, please comment below if you have any questions or if there's anything that you want to know about or anything you want to see, and I'll be happy to give you more information about that. Um, also, the footage that was shown uh, during the beginning of this video was from 8mm film that was in a shoebox along with several other rolls. And I sent these to be processed and uh, I was able to glean about 10 minutes with worth of footage from Japan. Uh, there was no footage of my biological mother, but as you can see, there was footage about my parents, um, Donna Rosie Smith and me when I was first adopted and before we came back to the United States. So I hope to see you soon. Thank you so much for watching. Arigato gozaimasu.